So as I mentioned in the beginning, lots going on today. It's Father's Day, which I recently learned was first celebrated in the United States in connection with a memorial for hundreds of men who perished in a mine accident in Monoga, West Virginia, 1907. So there's your cocktail party trivia today. Um, always happy to serve here. Today is also the 399th birthday of Blaise Pascal. Did you know that? Anybody wake up and have pancakes and toast to Blaise Pascal? Is that famous French mathematician, religious philosopher, and 17th century inventor of the first mechanical calculator, the syringe, the hydraulic press, and calculus. So thank you, Blaise. Many of us barely made it through high school thanks to you. <laughs> As I mentioned at the beginning of the hour, it's also Juneteenth, our youngest federal holiday, coming right in after Martin Luther King Day, which was added in 1983, and Columbus Day, which was added in 1968. Juneteenth, also known as Emancipation Day or Freedom Day, marks, somewhat symbolically, the end of slavery in the United States. When President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, he sent out troops to enforce the decree in the former Confederate states and territories. And those troops didn't arrive in the southernmost outposts of slaveholding areas for quite some time. One of the last places they came to was Galveston, Texas, where on June 19, 1865, they arrived to proclaim to the enslaved peoples there that they were free, or rather that they had been free but didn't yet know it. And for me, there is something so beautiful and haunting and poignant in imagining that event. Like, here are these people, still enslaved, and they don't know it yet, but the good news is coming. It is coming. Their freedom is already assured, they just haven't seen it yet. It's very theological. I was also glad to be reminded in thinking about this event that the Emancipation Proclamation was more than just some words on a page, right? It was more than just saying this is what we intended to do. Lincoln had to actually enforce it to get some skin in the game to make it a reality, which always seems true of our work for justice now as much as then. It takes power. And I think about those troops, and I just love to imagine the sense of purpose and righteousness that they might have had, right? Because... There are still people who need the message that we are carrying. There are still people that need the liberation we bear, which gives us motivation to press on. Which is interesting, because that's us, right? That's Christian disciples with the gospel and the power to enact the gospel. You know the story that we heard this morning from the Gospel of Luke? It's all about power. You thought it was about pigs. Glad you came to church today. It's about power. Now this is one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of Luke. It's just so visceral. Not a lot of stories in the Gospel have this level of detail, right? You can hear the chains clanging and the pigs squealing. You've got all these sensory details. Did you hear that? All the sensory detail. We could act it out if you like right up here with some volunteers maybe we'll wait till the next time this comes up in the lectionary but beyond the sensory details this story does have a lot going on there's so many layers to unpack first off its placement within the gospel is really important this happens during a part of the narrative in which jesus is just going from place to place and he's teaching and he's healing all within the region of judea but then comes this episode when Jesus kind of just veers out of the familiar lands, crosses the Sea of Galilee, here called the Lake of Gennesaret, for his one and only foray, in the Gospel of Luke at least, into Gentile territory. And while they're on their way there, a storm comes up on the sea, which terrifies the disciples. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. Remember that? That's when they're on their way to the land of the Gerasenes. And Jesus is sleeping, and they have to wake him up. And he wakes up, and he calms the storm. And they are amazed, but they're also kind of sobered by this, right? Like, who is this guy who tells the wind what to do? 
And just as they're sort of integrating that event, they land on the shore of the Gerasenes, a foreign people, more likely than not to be hostile to them. Okay, so if we are reading this for the first time, our anxiety should already be a little high at this point in the story, right? We've got this wild Jesus character who's telling the wind what to do, and now we're in this foreign land, it's a little bit threatening, we don't know what's going to happen. And Jesus is immediately greeted by this incredible scene, right? This demon-possessed man, so fierce and uncontrolled, that his community has given up trying to help him and allowed him to live tortured among the tombs. Which, as an aside, just brings to my mind so many of our chronically houseless neighbors who seem to live a similar existence, and I just don't know what to do or how to help them. And I think we get tired when they don't stay where we want to contain them, and we wish they would just go away, but they still haunt us. Has anybody else shared that experience watching some of our neighbors? So they're in this kind of gut-wrenching time, and there's Jesus, and we wonder, what's he going to do? And rather than shying away from this confrontation, he engages this man in conversation. And here's some more creepy news to elevate our sense of doom in this scene. The demons that are inside this man, they already know Jesus. Even though they've never seen him before, they already know who he is and what he is. But Jesus, right, we heard, keeps on. What is your name, he says. And here is where things get very scary. If this were a horror movie... It would be the part where the monster, right, or the enemy, or the villain, like, seethes something very terrifying that suddenly puts everything in perspective and takes our fear to the next level. You guys must not watch a lot of horror movies. You know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> he says, I am Legion. And if we were first century readers for whom this account was intended, we would be shaking in our boots. Because with that name would come a cascade of associations of not only the strangeness and danger of this foreign place, but also the violence of the foreign oppressor, Rome, and its legions. You know, some biblical commentators today believe that because Luke was writing later in time, uh, long after Jesus' death, that he may have been referring to a specific incident when he writes this scene that has to do with the Jewish uprising and the destruction of the temple in the Jerusalem that happened in about 70 CE. Details that would have populated the person's minds hearing this story. So commentator Judith Jones recounts that the region of Gerasene is a setting of a really traumatic historical event in the late 60s, toward the end of the Jewish revolt, when the Roman general Vespasian sent soldiers to retake this area and killed a thousand young men there. They also imprisoned their families and burned the city and attacked villages throughout the region. And the place where all those people who got slaughtered were buried was in the Gerasene tombs. So here is all of these elements, right? This kind of scary guy and this kind of foreign place and the background is this kind of scary time that they're all living in. This very real fear that a person might have there of these broader forces at work. So we're like supposed to be on the edge of our seats. I don't know if you knew any of this while Danger was reading it. If you were like on the edge of your seat, like what's going to happen? So what does Jesus do now? He does the same thing he does in the storm. He makes a command. He commands the demons to come out and they obey him. And in a twist of narrative fate that was probably meant as some sort of dark humor, the demons beg to be cast into some swine rather than in the abyss, but they're shortly drowned anyway, right? And perhaps this too is symbolic, the legions that I, meant, uh, that I mentioned earlier that came to Gerasene, the ones that wreaked such havoc after the uprising, their symbol it was on their money and on their flags was a pig. And so Jesus steps into this dangerous place, steps among these dangerous people and with these dangerous symbols and shows his power. And the truth is, if you keep reading a little bit in the story, that nobody knows quite what to do about that. 
Like some of them celebrate. Strangely, the pig owners seem pretty pumped up about this. I don't know if they're just sort of like tired of their vocation managing all these pigs, but they're like, ha ha, yeah, you got the demons out into our pigs. Legion, obviously, is also um, very happy to have been liberated from this experience. But the townspeople are not so sure about this. Right? They're really wary about this whole situation. And I have to say, though, I can understand that liberation is the goal, that I can't really blame them. Right? Somebody who commands the wind and has authority over demons is not somebody to trifle with. Maybe not somebody that you want just sitting around in your local plaza having a beer with the neighbors, right? This is someone really powerful. And, you know, it occurs to me that sometimes I think we undersell this particular aspect of Jesus' identity, especially in the more progressive wing of the church. You know, it tends to be true that the human side of Jesus is so compelling to us over here, right? We want to talk about his actions and life and the justice and love your neighbor and blessed are the peacemakers. We tend to underemphasize some other aspects of his identity, including this power that he has, which seems to come from God. And I have to tell you, though, that I don't know that the story about Jesus, this story, or the broader story, which we call the whole gospel, I don't know that the story of Jesus can be understood or taken seriously without thinking about his power and how that informs his identity. I mean, much as we would love to believe that everybody woke up one morning and listened to Jesus because he was a nice guy and had some happy, clappy ideas about love, the truth is that they listened to those ideas because they were accompanied by these powerful deeds, liberation and healing. And when we think about Jesus, about his life and death, I think we have to think about that too. And this story, the one about Legion, is a story where Jesus' power is on full display. And here's the even more wild news. Immediately after this story, this is a really important part, is that bit, maybe you remember from Sunday school, where Jesus shares that power with his disciples and sends them out into the world to proclaim the good news. Right? First 12 of them, and then 70 of them, and then everyone who follows him, which I hate to break it to you, is you guys. <laughs> and me. If this were a superhero movie, any superhero movie watchers out there, I just, my horror movie joke sort of bomb. If this were a superhero movie, it would be the part where the hero shares the secret like with the sidekick. And now the sidekick kind of realizes that she or he's got to start doing the heroics too, right? Like the meaning is, we're Batman now. We're Batman now, is what I'm saying. As followers of Jesus, we are meant to understand that we have access to the same power that animated his ministry. Maybe that sounds a little woo-woo to some of you. I don't know if you walk around thinking, I have the power that Jesus had, but I think it is an important part of the witness of the gospel that is mentioned again and again and again and again by Jesus himself and then by those who followed him. I don't think we can dismiss it. I don't think we can dismiss that we have power. We have earthly power, maybe in the form of privilege or collective action, and we have spiritual power. The power of the Spirit at work in and around and among us. And we can use that in the same way that Jesus did. To go into places of darkness and places of suffering and places of sadness and to bring not only good news of healing and liberation but also power to create those things. We are the ones that have been sent out with the good news to share it with others. And certainly in our own lives, in the collective life of our church, we owe that news the urgency and dedication that it deserves. And now you're saying that sounds so nice. With Pastor Liz, I really don't feel like I have any power. We don't feel like we can do any of these things. Were any of you thinking that? You don't have to admit it. Um, we don't, we're not superheroes. We don't have all this power. Well... It's a good thing that I happen to know that it's the 399th birthday of Blaise Pascal because he's got something to say to you if you just thought that. Can you believe that? I'm bringing it all together. Here's a great quote from Blaise Pascal. If you don't have faith, try acting as though you do. Do the things that a faithful person would do, and over time you may well find your actions leading your heart and mind in a faithful direction. 
In other words, don't worry too much about what you believe. Focus instead on your actions and how you are living, and your convictions will surely follow. I think that we try to pay tribute to that, right? By behaving as though we have power to manifest peace and justice in this world. We try together. We try to go to places where people are being liberated and join the fight. We share in the good news with our friends. Hopefully that's what we're doing somehow this weekend. We celebrate all that is being loosed for good and for justice in this world. And we deploy all the power we have in service to that. But also, we remember this, and this is a message to each of us personally that I think we can't walk away from this story without taking it seriously. There is no place so dark that God cannot and will not reach you there. There is no place so fearful, so broken, or so forgotten that God is not willing to come to you in that place. The good news is coming for you coming for us. Maybe you can't see it yet, maybe we can't see it yet, but it is coming. That is the promise of the gospel. That nowhere is beyond the reach of God's love, that nowhere is beyond the reach of God's freedom and God's salvation, not even the grave. And so we go out singing, and we go out celebrating, resting in that good news, we march on. So I want to dedicate these words to the God who created, redeemed, and sustained us always. And we're going to try something 